The Brandon Peters Show may contain explicit language and detailed plot points. For more information on the show, stay tuned to the end of the episode. Welcome to another fabulous week here on The Brandon Peters Show. Today we'll be discussing the 1998 film Out of Sight. And alongside for discussion, I'm very excited to welcome one of my old podcasting co-hosts, a Drama Desk winner, Drama League winner, a GLAAD Award winning Broadway producer, and one of the hosts of Front Center Mezzanine, and now Tony Award nominated, The Marvelous Maxwell Haddad. Oh gosh, when you put it all like that, it's a little overwhelming. Yeah. I try to I try to be real humble and then you hear it all spelled out like that and you're like, Oh yeah, that's pretty cool. That's me. But you notice when it comes to the, the Broadway stuff, I kept saying wins. So maybe they should start engraving your name on the Tony now? Oh, I don't want to get ahead of myself. <laughs> Fra- frankly, they haven't even announced when they're going to hold the awards this year. Fair enough. Obviously, with everything going on, it's been sort of a fly by the seat of the pants. So we'll see. We, we have some competition. It's just an honor to be nominated. Right. Me. Yeah, so, I'm sure. I'm sure <laughs> it really is. Tickled to see your name and just be like, oh, well, OK, that's a life achievement. Not many people get to see. It. It's true. It's true. You know, I sort of had set like very lofty goals for myself by a certain age and getting a Tony nomination was one of those. And I achieved it far earlier in my life than I ever could have anticipated. So it's all downhill from here. Excellent. Well, congrats. And I, I thank you. Thank br- you. Brushed to that before, but you and I know each other from podcasting stuff, really, I think. Yeah. Or- you know, mm-hmm. I, th- I think we first met cause we were both frequent guests on uh, out now with Aaron mm-hmm. and Abe. Yeah. And and then, gosh, I don't know, God, I don't know what year it was, but we had a podcast about the Fox TV show Sleepy Hollow yeah. called the Ichapod Crane Cast. Yes, which the name was the best thing about the podcast. I thought. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, we did a twenty four uh, one also. Didn't we did twenty four was our follow up when it came back, and the Ichapod Crane Cast is funny because one. I think Entertainment Weekly or something started their own and they called it Ica Pod and they sent Aaron an email just like, hey, sorry, but not sorry. We're going to call her something similar, but cool. I remember uh, that. And then we stopped the show just because we were three honest guys and we weren't going to feign interest in a show that was kind of wearing on us. It had a, a terrific first season and then yeah. it went down downhill fast. I don't like to spend my time trashing things. If I don't right. like something, I would rather not talk about it at all. Mm-hmm. And so it didn't feel fun to continue doing a podcast about a show right. that I once really enjoyed and now is sort of just slogging through week by week. So. Yeah, we were all, we, there'd be like a week between and be like, oh, I don't, I don't know. But yeah, we did that. And then we did Jack and Chloe and that was fun. That was a good. That was fun. Yeah, that was good. That was our that was third season of <laughs> Sleepy Hollow. For sure. People. Yeah, exactly. Since then, you've been getting it. I mean, not getting, you've probably always been into, but a lot more of your podcasting and stuff has been like theater focused, Broadway, yeah. uh, things like that. You may be Tony Ward nominated now, but you've been producing a lot of plays and stuff, like funding and things like that the past half decade. Yeah, so I, uh, not not that not quite that long. So, okay. you know, I've been, I've been a theater fan my whole life. My parents always took me to the theater. And then when it came time for college and I went to college in Philadelphia, it was a 90 minute bolt bus or mega bus ride into the city on the weekend so i would just come and see theater and i I acted in in theater and in high school and the musicals and stuff so it was always a passion of mine and then in about 2016 i decided to start investing in theater which was sort of my way in to start getting to meet people start networking and put my money where my mouth is because Mm -hmm. you know i love theater and i have very strong ideas about what the future of theater can and should be. I think a lot of it is antiquated and broken, not to get overtly political, but there's a lot of systemic racism. There's a lot of, you would expect the theater industry to be more inclusive. And from my experience, it's not as inclusive and opening as it can and should be. I'm not saying or suggesting that I alone can 
make any sort of impact, but I have met a lot of people who feel similarly. Mm -hmm. And together we have tried to work on projects and support theater artists whom we think have a voice worthy of hearing who maybe wouldn't get heard otherwise. In 2016, I started investing in shows and then I formed a company with two people and we started producing shows as well as concerts. You know, there's a lot of cabaret clubs in the city. So we were doing all sorts of fun concerts. It's not necessarily a way to make money, but it's a great way to show off new work and have a good time. So Right. Experiment there and take it yeah. further. Yeah. And sometimes if it works out, you can. Mm-hmm. It's a great way to like workshop a show, see what people think, and then you never know what, what could be next with that material. Mm-hmm. And you also share your appreciation for it on the Front Center Medicineine, which how long has that show been going? So we started that show in June. We've mm-hmm. done 10 episodes. We try to do one every two weeks, but with scheduling and stuff, it's been more like one every two to three weeks. But I've loved doing that. Every episode, we have a different guest from the theater industry. We've had composers, we've had producers, we've had actors. And I I really try to make it relaxed and casual. I want my guests to feel comfortable and just be a very open conversation about everything from their childhood to their career in theater. And they, they tend to go about two hours. So, And the guests, when they're done, they always say, you know, I had such a good time. That felt so much more relaxed than the typical interview where it's like stock questions. So I really like doing that. Is there a big world for that in like podcasting or vi- video blog or whatever? Because I mean, for when I saw you starting, I was like, oh, that's a good idea. It doesn't I don't typically in my realm of seeing things, that's uh, I don't see much of that. There are definitely plenty, you know, not as many as there are about film and television, but there's a good number of very good theater-based podcasts. I think interview ones specifically, less so, especially video. Broadway.com, the editor is a guy named Paul Wanterock, who for years has done, I don't know, every week or every month, I'm not sure exactly, like half an hour interviews with Broadway performers and, and writers and stuff. So it's certainly not a new concept by any stretch of the imagination, but I do it as part of a podcast network that is primarily Mm movie-based. And the reason why I like doing that and the feedback from our listeners or watchers, people mostly watch as opposed to listen, is that they are learning about a world they were not familiar with prior. Mm -hmm. And to me, that means I'm doing my job, right? You know, people who love film, love television, theater is just another form of storytelling, and to like illuminate all the inside baseball, the secrets, the surprises, everything that can go on in a Broadway production and educate people and, and have a good time too. It's been awesome. Yeah, that's great. Like sort of like crossing over from one industry to another. Cause obviously, you know how much I love cinema. I went to film mm-hmm. school, like, you know, film was my, my thing. And so to find a way to bridge the gaps, it's exciting. Yeah. I have a, I was a theater kid in high school and stuff. And I live in an area where, there is stuff. There's a lot of stuff, but to, you know, when you're at New York, it's just, that is the thing. That's like a whole world. I tell my children, I'm like, yeah, there's a whole world of celebrity, big names, really talented people that you go to New York, boom. It's kind of like Vegas has that too, where it's local, but they're larger than life local. That Yeah. I, you know, I think just... barring the few minor exceptions, the people I would consider big Broadway stars are probably mm-hmm. not household names across America, right? Yeah. But, but in New York, they're superstars, you know, and then of course mm-hmm. you have people like Nathan Lane or Bette Midler, or when Daniel Craig or Hugh Jackman come to Broadway, people everybody knows, and they're very talented, but there's so many incredibly talented theater people who, if you're in the theater industry in New York, you know, and you respect, and then a lot of other people have probably never even heard of them before. Yeah. And, and it's like, a, it's a huge, they're like huge, huge, like not just like, oh, I know this person. But yeah, it's a whole different world that people should experience when they go to visit too. Like just absolutely spend your time at the theater the whole time. You want <laughs> it's <laughs> look, it's been it's been tough. I mean, there are a myriad reasons why COVID has been tough for everybody. Right. But for me, you know, and the city really, you know, the theater shut down, which, you know, the Broadway League, which is sort of like the governing organization of Broadway mm-hmm. has now said at the earliest Broadway will reopen in June. Of next year and 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 who knows even at this point if that's going to be the case or not mm-hmm. that means it will have been closed for 14 months at least which is yeah 
the longest. Devastating, yeah. It's devastating on so many levels, financially, so many of these actors, because, yeah, a handful of them do very well, but for the most part, the ensemble members, the stalwart actors who have a career Mm -hmm. are not making exorbitant money so they've they're now out of insurance because they're not working they're really really struggling and obviously of course it affects the economy of the city because tourists come to yeah. new york to see broadway that's like our, what our you have, big, yeah. yeah so it, it's been tough on so many levels and then for me personally it's just like i would be going to the theater three times a week so you know everyone is is missing things and it's hard to be selfish but sometimes you have to reflect and be a little selfish and i'm like i miss live theater so much right i bet uh, i bet i had a i talked about recently i had a friend who uh rented out and this is theater and theater but rented out a, a imax theater and only invited nine people to watch tenet in it oh that's cool and i got i got invited he invited me to go and it was weird just sitting in there and when the warner brother logo came up i got like choked up because i'm like i love doing this I, it's weird it's this tenant this is just a logo but it just that rush is going to happen and i think a lot of people once we can get back it's going to be emotional and i think it's going to restore the love of some of these things that people are like oh this is the death of them I'm like just hold off a lot of people are preemptively writing articles about the death of cinema obviously mm-hmm. we're seeing Wonder Woman's coming to streaming. Mulan Mm -hmm. went to streaming. There's talk about the next Godzilla coming to streaming. And okay, in the short term, that might be an appropriate fix. But I genuinely believe that the long-term effect of this will be people will re-fall in love with going to the movie theater. Also, partly because when it's safe to do so, when the vaccine is, you know, been mass produced enough, people are just going to be happy to have somewhere to go. Right. Yeah, right. Con- like con- concerts, ball games, like all the things are gonna. Yep. Get a, the entertainment sort of industry, the sports industry, all that stuff. I think is gonna boom. Maybe not at first. You know, I think there will be some hesitation. Uh, is it safe yet? What do I do? But mm-hmm. I really think a lot of people are gonna be like, "Oh, I gotta go do something." I've been sitting in my house right for a year now. <laughs> Introverts will become extroverts. <laughs> that, yeah, that maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um, maybe. You want to talk a little about the inheritance? The one you're nominated for? Sure. Yeah, yeah. The, the Inheritance is a really special play. So it's uh, written by a guy named Matthew Lopez, directed by Stephen Daldry, the filmmaker who, you know, has done stuff like Billy Elliot and The Hours. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's a very notable, well-known filmmaker. It originally played in London. And what's unique about it is it's actually two parts. And the total runtime of the two parts encroaches on seven hours. So it's really a marathon of an experience much in the tradition of Angels in America, which was, of course, a landmark queer play in the 90s, which was also similarly two parts and very long. And it's about a group of younger gay men living in modern New York. And through the people they meet, some of whom are from an older generation, it sort of talks about how uh, it's important important to look back at the people who walked the paths you're on before you and the steps and impact they had so you could be where you are today especially in the queer community because it's all that's what it's all about like it reflects back on the AIDS crisis and the the advances that we still have a long way to go but you know how more much more accepted it is now and then how much more difficult it was for gay men in the 80s and mm-hmm. early 90s and it's based on the E.M. Forster book Howard's End and okay. so E.M. E.M. Forster is actually a character in the play oh. sort of serving as a narrator throughout uh, so it's a really interesting dramatic conceit I was so passionate about it when I read it. I thought it was so powerful and beautiful and emotional. I loved how minimalistic the directing was. There were no big set pieces. The stage was sort of just like a giant white square elevated from the stage. So the entire ensemble could sort of sit with their feet dangling below. No actors oh. wore shoes. And then when it came time for the scene, they would just sort of scoot up and get on the platform and perform there was lighting and costume changes but it was it really allowed the text and the performances to speak for themselves and i thought some of the performances were just incredible so for me and my producing partners on this play it was really just special to be a part of it regardless of what has happened with all the awards we've won and gotten nominated for it felt like an important play and i firmly believe that 
you know, even though it wasn't as huge of a financial success here in New York as we had expected, which ended up not mattering because we would have been shut down due to COVID anyways. <laughs> I really think it's a play that people will buy and read and love. And I also mm-hmm. think because of the nature of it, because of the length, it is perfectly suited for like a prestige miniseries. Wow, yeah. Well, like Angels in America became a miniseries. Yeah, exactly. So whether it's Netflix or HBO or Mm -hmm. something like that, I I would not be surprised in a few years to see uh, that sort of adaptation of it. Yeah, I'd I'd definitely like to see it somehow, some way. So if that's the way, then then definitely. That's, That's really cool. And that's nominated not just for with you um, for best play it's like across the board got a lot of nominations i I think we got 11 nominations look i fully recognize that this was an unusual year not everything Mm -hmm. that was meant to open opened so maybe there will be an asterisk next to this year's tony awards but you know it's still (laughs) you know yeah you know five years from now no one's gonna remember that anyways and we're still amongst there's some other great plays and great performers nominated so well i mean if you go back Let's go back decades. How many were not available for nomination during a year? You know, it's sure. just, that's it, the it, amount that came out. Yeah, and there are fluctuating years. Like you can go back and look. There are some years where there are only two musicals nominated for best musical because like only yeah. three three opened. Flip a so, coin, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, every year is different and has its own scenarios that come down. Awesome. Well, that's I'm really excited for you. Proud of you. That's just I appreciate it. Incredible. That's great. Another thing I thought was really awesome that you've done recently was the Smashathon. Oh uh, yeah, where you raised over fifteen thousand dollars and doing Schmodown stuff. Where you were an excellent play caller. That was oh thanks. Some funny stuff there. Um, you had John Roca who was on this show a couple of last month. Yeah, uh, and that was a that was a really fun, successful event, and, and it had to been draining by the end because it was how many hours straight we ended up going for like a minute shy of 30 hours okay and during that 30 hours i got maybe 70 minutes of intermittent sleep (laughs) on accident like (laughs) sort of yeah i mean (laughs) i wasn't on camera the whole time although i was a a fair amount but i was always backstage you know i i I have no interest in taking credit for it because it was really i don't know if your listeners are or you you yourself are familiar with the schmodown Mm -hmm. at all but you know it's a really incredible community there's so many different like podcasts that like Mm -hmm. cover it sort of like if you were like espn talking about a baseball game yeah you know, they talk about the the trivia matches in the Schmodown. And mm-hmm. so it was really the whole community coming together. But there were like five or six of us who were sort of anchors to make sure everything ran smoothly. We're always there. You know, so we did it through StreamYard. But mm-hmm. then we had a Zoom running backstage to where we were all chatting, okay. watching, making sure everything was going. But honestly, like in our wildest, wildest dreams we raised more money than we ever could have anticipated i mean the yeah. outpouring of support was unreal kevin smets who who it was all for is an right. incredible human being he, he has unfortunately been fighting stage three colon cancer he's only in his early 40s so uh, you know he has a, yeah. a very good shot but it sort of devastated his life. He also just got married this year. He has a, a newborn baby. So it's just devastating. So it was our pleasure to do whatever we could to help him. And, and people really, really came out to support him in, in a way that was very overwhelming and emotional. And it reminded me, you know, it's been a tough year. It's, there's been yeah. a lot of cynicism and negativity. And it really reminded me of the power of empathy in the human spirit. Yeah. I know that might sound a little cheesy, but that was really how I felt at the yeah. end of it. Like when I finally got good sleep and had time to reflect, it it was like one of the most positive experiences of my life because it was yeah. amazing how people could get together for a common cause and do good. Yeah. You don't I don't think you see that enough. No, and I just I just personally myself did an event. I did it was 12 hours long and I I was only there for 3 hours of it, but doing things for a make a wish foundation playing i was doing some live trivia games stuff like that but and i've seen some people combat this stuff and it really bothers me where people are trying to do positive things despite what's going on and trying to not make the best of it type thing but trying to do something with it trying to keep their art their lives their foundations going and trying to find avenues 
and giving them something to get their brain off or be productive with it. And I've seen some people like, guys, just ignoring all this stuff going around. Like, no, like, why cannot, why can't we try these things? And it just, it, that bothers me. But I, I like seeing events like that. I'm like, it's like you're breaking through. Like, you won't stop me. We're still going to do this. And well, I've always, I've always felt, and I think this speaks to your, your point you're just making and the complaint that, that some people may have is like, yeah. Just because at one particular time you're focusing on one cause doesn't mean right. you are ignoring or shunning all other causes. Yeah. You can, you, your mind can operate and care about multiple things at the same time and you can choose mm-hmm. what to focus on. And if you were doing any good, making any sort of impact, there's no room for naysaying. No. Those people are, are just myopic and closed-minded. Right, yeah. It, 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 sometimes it just irks me, but like that's one thing I've seen. I'm like, people are doing yeah. good things. We're, we're, we're all trying, like, I, I, like someone bashing stand-up comedians still trying to do something because they, they've lost their homes and stuff, and it's like, it sucks. It's not the same, but they got to do something. It's healthy, you know? Rather I, you know than there, there's faster. been a lot of really incredible screaming art that has come out of the last mm-hmm. eight or nine months you know pe- yeah. a lot of people have had to piv- pivot some has been more successful than others but i yeah. give nothing but credit to anyone who's like you know what i have to keep working and make it work yeah. and and a lot of them have done a great job it's been really really yeah. good to see people you know right you done that you started front center men- visiting during this uh i started this show yeah. during this things have evolved they've changed people found did find drive despite the odd yeah how can i help you sir hi you're being held up get your hands in the air in a dangerous world i'm a federal marshal and you're under arrest a life of crime Put the gun down. It's better. That's it, man. Than no life at all. You know they're going to set us up. I get that feeling, yeah. If I were you, I'd get up and run. George Clooney, Jennifer Lopez, Out of Sight. Rated R. Starts Friday, June 26th at theaters everywhere. Out of Sight is directed by Steven Soderbergh and stars George Clooney, Jennifer Lopez. Hold on, just let me roll through these. Ving Rhames, Don Cheadle, Catherine Keener, Dennis Farina, Viola Davis, Steve Zahn, Nancy Allen, Isaiah Washington, Luis Guzman, Michael Keaton, Samuel L. Jackson, and Albert Brooks. It's based on the 1996 Elmore Leonard novel of the same name. The film is about a career bank robber who breaks out of jail and shares a moment of mutual attraction with a U.S. Marshal he has kidnapped. Maxwell, okay, this movie's fantastic, but what made you want to bring it to the table for this show? Just like that. Like you said, I think it's an incredible movie. I, and I, th- I think it's interesting because when you look back both at the cinema of the 90s and the career of Steven Soderbergh, who I th- would argue is one of the great American filmmakers of the last 20 to 30 years, oh, for some easily. reason, for some reason, this one I find gets missed or overlooked a lot. Uh, yeah. Um, this is a movie I, you know, I've always loved. I think it's so good. And it, I'll mention it and it'll, people have like a vague memory of it or they'll be like oh j-lo's in it oh i don't want to watch her in a movie which is <laughs> besides Dude. the fact that i think she's been good in many movies she's incredibly good in this movie the frame can barely contain her she's so larger than life like well and and that's the other thing like i would say this is and i'm not talking about nudity i'm not talking mm-hmm. about like sex scenes but this is one of the sexiest movies I've ever seen. Oh yeah, this is because hot. <laughs> because, because of, of two things. The chemistry between Clooney and Lopez mm-hmm. is is the sort of lightning in a bottle chemistry you so rarely find. Mm-hmm. And the editing. Oh, uh, yes. Which was Oscar nominated. The editing in this film is some of the best I've ever seen. There's a sequence, oh gosh, about halfway through where George Clooney and J-Lo are in a hotel bar. Mm-hmm. And I think it's snowing outside. Uh huh. Yeah. And just the way that scene is is edited and shot, the glances, the close up of the glass, there, it's just so sexy. Oh yeah, I love. And that's the, not the to mention this too. Yeah, the, it's. And that's not to mention the the scene in the trunk towards the beginning when it mm-hmm. all starts, which is sort of icky to a certain point. And there is definitely an element of Stockholm syndrome towards the relationship mm-hmm. that forms between Karen, Cisco, and Jack, mm-hmm. but. I think the movie does a good job of giving Karen agency and strength. Yeah. So it doesn't feel, for me, by the end of the film, icky. 
Yeah. You also get a sense of you can't really read her mind on things as well. You don't know whether she is taking, she enjoyed it, but it knows how to take advantage of the situation to win the day. Or is she really struck with him? Like it's, it's, it's never 100% clear with Karen with Clooney. Yes. 100%. Yes. With her. Well, and I, I think that's a testament also to JLo is like, she plays it so perfectly. Like she has mm-hmm. this steely. Oh yeah. Bat, badass exterior. And, and there are times where you see her slipping a little bit mm-hmm. and then you have to think, is she slipping because she's slipping or is she doing that to manipulate Jack? Exactly. Because remember she's a U.S. Marshal. She's trying to catch mm-hmm. Jack and bring him to jail. And so is it all part of a ruse? And that dynamic between them is so fascinating throughout the film. And she's also playing um, a game to get ahead of work, too. There's times sure. where she takes advantage of making her boss look bad or clowning him because yeah. he didn't, yeah. Yeah, and Car- Karen Sisko, I think, is one of the great literary characters of, of our time. You know, it's there was a, a TV show called Karen Sisko yep. where Carla G- Gugino G- uh, yeah, played yeah, the role. And then Carla got to sort of play the same character on Justified. They didn't, have, which is also, you know, that series right. Justified was also based on an Elmore Leonard novel. Mm-hmm. If I'm not mistaken, they didn't exactly have the rights to the Karen Sisko name, yeah. but they did just enough. And it was Carla again that you knew that's who she was supposed right. to be. But the other thing about this movie is there's a lot of movies in the 90s that felt like Tarantino ripoffs, knockoffs, heavily mm-hmm. inspired. It would be easy to say that this is one of those, but in in some ways, and this may be sacrilegious to some mm-hmm. people, I think it surpasses Tarantino's 90s crime films. It's more accessible. It bit. is more it more accessible. You know, and the other thing is Jackie mm-hmm. Brown is also based on an Elmore Leonard novel. Right. So Michael Keaton plays the same character in both movies. Right. And I call this so I call this one a handshake movie with Jackie Brown because it's not just Keaton that comes back. It's the direction of the score that kind sure. of marries him because David Holmes, he uses a lot of Lalo Schifrin infer- uh, yes. influence, Miles Davis, and it gets that watchka a little bit of that exploitation 70s sound to it, which means we're kind of in the same world here, but here's how Soderbergh handles it rather than Tarantino. So they're different ends of the park. The two films make a great double feature, and I oh, actually yeah. prefer... I, I love Pulp Fiction. I actually prefer Jackie Brown to Pulp Fiction. I think it's a more introspective and mature film to a certain level. I think right. it was Tarantino really flexing his muscles in a different way. Um, I was crazy films, when I said that in 97. Now it's uh, more people I, You know, say. In, in 97, <laughs> I could imagine. And again, I, I love Pulp Fiction. I think it's a fantastic right. oh, movie. But there's brilliant. something about about Jackie Brown that, I, that resonates with me even more. And there are a lot of similarities in this. You were reading off the ensemble. It's just yeah. like name after name of people giving incredible performances. Like Steve Zahn is hilarious. Yeah, Luis Guzman is always a always great. The late great Dennis Farina as as J Lo's father, mm-hmm. such a great character this is actor. A, a nice uh, uh, different role for Catherine Keener, kind of too. Like yeah. I really like this her this part with her. Yeah, I mean, ever, like the movie's just populated with so many people who have gone on to have incredible careers, and of course. We would not have Ocean's Eleven if not for this movie. When I've tried to pitch people to watch this movie, I'm like, imagine an R-rated Ocean's Eleven. Yeah. Where it's it's a little grittier, a little more violent, but a very similar thing where you have Clooney playing a very charismatic, charming criminal. More rural. Uh, like. Yeah, no. People, well, yeah. a lot of it takes place in Detroit. And then, mm-hmm. you know, the incredible climax with Albert Brooks in his house where the mm-hmm. reveal is that the diamonds are like the rocks in the bottom of the fish tank. Yes. It's just so good. This is one of those I would honestly label a perfect movie. There's nothing I would change. I, I agree. Works. Like it is... It is in my top 20 favorite films of all time. Yeah. That's how much I love it. And and I wish more people talked about it. So, the, you know, I'm, I'm so happy to get to talk about it. And if, yeah. if even if even one person who listens to this or watches this is like, oh, I'm going to go watch that movie, then I, I yeah. I'll feel I'll feel happy. Even with the spoilers, trust me, it plays so well. It like, does. <laughs> oh, and I also, I'm not always crazy about films that are nonlinear. Mm-hmm. But I think the structure of this and its flashbacks... Right. Works really well. Well, and the opening is phenomenal. It's one of the best bank heist scenes yep. of all time. 1998, I was 11 years old when this okay. came out. I saw it in theaters on opening day with my mom. It's rated R, so I was probably too young. But I, I would go to sleepaway camp every summer. Okay. 
and I loved movies. So the day, like the Friday before I would leave for sleepaway camp on Saturday, my mom would always take me to see two movies and it would normally be whatever two movies open that day. Mm-hmm. So if I'm not mistaken, the other movie that opened that day was Dr. Doolittle, the Eddie Murphy one. Yes. <laughs> so we saw those two movies and this movie blew my little 11 year old mind. Oh, I bet. But, but I got the, the soundtrack mm-hmm. and much like the Pulp Fiction soundtrack, it's interspersed with dialogue clips from the oh, film. Oh, cool. I which I love. Soundtrack. And so that you were, you were talking about the opening bank robbery scene. Mm-hmm where he goes and he robs this bank. He doesn't have a gun. He's literally just smooth talking his way into robbing this bank. Mm -hmm. And that that dialogue clip is in the CD towards the beginning. I would listen to that over and over again when I was younger. Right. And the thing is, I watched that. I was like, would that work? Like, it's so convincing. You're like, would that work? Would that be it? Yeah, I mean, maybe. I mean, I think you need to have the innate charisma and charm of someone like George Clooney to pull that off. And that scene kind of says... I'm here to stay. Like a lot of people say George Clooney arrived here. I'm like, uh, there's a lot of his Seth Gecko performance coming here that he's done. But, and this is coming off Batman and Robin the previous year, which didn't really do him, him harm. Maybe um, previous year or the same year? It was 1997. was Batman, oh, and, Batman Robin. and Robin. Oh, Batman and Robin was 1997. Okay. Yeah. And this, so, this is so his last I, year of ER. Was when I think happened. it would be safe to argue this is the movie that convinced the world that Clooney's a movie star. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like the trans the transition from TV to film is not always easy. A lot of people try and fail. I'm looking at you, mm-hmm. Catherine Heigl. <laughs> but this movie, it was clear that this was a guy who yeah. was destined to light up the silver screen. Yeah, for sure. And I will say that this, besides being one of the best films ever made, this is a film where actors, a director that really understands Hollywood star power. And this is his first huge leap, but he understands how to use it. It has a fully formed, evolved sense of what worked in Hollywood's golden years of male-female actor chemistry. Yep. And But it doesn't sit and wax nostalgic. It just knows the beats, the structure, plays the strengths. And Clooney, Lopez, Soderbergh, Rhymes, Brooks, Cheadle, everybody plays to their strengths. And it's just well, it, it, you know, I think it, it took those golden era of Hollywood elements mm-hmm. and very seamlessly put it into a very stylish, what was then modern package. Right. And that's the, the thing too, is Soderbergh is nothing if not an incredibly stylish filmmaker. And before this, he had really done primarily super independent films. I mean, he had done right. Sex, Lies, and Videotape. He had a couple other stuff that was really good. But this was, I think, probably his first more mainstream film. Yeah. yeah and and I, th- and I think it showed, and why I love him so much as a filmmaker, is he can make a more mainstream film without sacrificing his artistic proclivities. Right. Like, go watch, like, go watch the Oceans movies. Mm-hmm. Like, there are not many trilogies in our time that are as Hollywood and splashy as those. Yeah. And yet they're still so artfully made. Even Ocean's 12, which I think gets unneedlessly shit on a lot. And I know that our friend Aaron and I yeah. agree on this, that it's one of the great meta sequels because yeah. it's Soderbergh really like trolling the audience and being like, you were expecting one thing and we made an art film in Europe. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I never expected. And that's the thing. He has this stunning balance of art house sensibilities with big budget visuals, star yeah. power, all that. Like, And this movie, like you could expect to be, you know, the nice mid-level player or the biggest movie of that, you know, that summer or whatever. It feels like it, though it wasn't, but God, it's grand. Nowadays, it wouldn't. It doesn't have, you know, a superhero or big blowing up things. But back well, in the 90s, know, this is the, what your the, big movie looked like. It's the sort of mid-budget adult skewing film that mm-hmm. I lament doesn't get made as much exactly anymore. yeah I mean you, you either have like the big tent poles superheroes fantasy stuff and I love that stuff mm-hmm. and then you have the art house independent stuff which I also love but there's this middle ground mm-hmm. like okay uh, earlier this year the way back the Ben yeah. Affleck movie that struck that chord but you don't see that type of movie a lot yeah. the mid budget adult skew so this really hits that and the other thing you have to talk about this movie is Scott Frank, whose screenplay is right. so sharp and so smart. And he just wrote every episode of Queen's Gambit. Excellent. Yeah. Which was a fantastic Netflix series. So it's been so nice to see his career go and from this. he got this nominated and, for this one, too. This was yeah, the other he got, nomination, he, yeah. He, he was nominated for this screenplay, and then he was also nominated for writing the screenplay of Logan. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So he was the first guy to get a screenplay nomination for a superhero movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 
he's pretty talented writer. <laughs> yeah, if, yeah, he's got he's got a couple things. Uh, I, the, the thing I like, yeah, is Soderbergh's able to keep his voice intact while making a big studio film. That's what I like. That's what I think lacks in some. Like, I think we're getting back to the. I've, I've said this before, but I feel like we're getting back to that producer-driven workman thing yep. from the 40s, 30s, and there's a element to that, but finding voices, you don't always get curtis with those. That's what we're getting back to, but I want a voice. I want something strong. I would like people to just make their film and not tend to worry about ancillary stuff. Well, I do. I go to the Marvel movies. I'm there opening weekend. I enjoy it, sure. but there's, a, there's not enough variety aside from it. Well, that, that's the bothersome. You know, it, when the, the first thing, obviously, that came to my mind when you were talking about producer-driven movies was the MCU, right? Because that's right. Kevin Feige through and through. Mm-hmm. And like you, I'm I'm at every MCU movie opening night. There's a lot of them I enjoy very much. Mm-hmm. There is no denying at the same time that a good majority of them are in a box. Mm-hmm. That being said, I do think more recently they have taken a few more risks. Like you can't deny right. that Thor Ragnarok right. is That's not one a of my favorites ta- too. <laughs> Taika Waititi film. Right. You can't deny that in Black Panther, Ryan Coogler was really able to bring what he wanted to bring to it. So it's been and nice the to see them. I yeah. Th- I mean, those, those are yeah. James Gunn through and through. Yep. So you can't deny that they have, as they have had more and more success, allowed their filmmakers a little more opportunity right. to bring in their sensibilities. But that is one of the great things about Soderbergh is mm-hmm. his ability to make, Hollywood movies with his style. Yeah. And then he would go and do Traffic and Aaron Brockovich two years yeah, later. Yeah, this starts his run. It's like, yeah, one of, me comes after only, this. One of only, th- from, if I'm not mistaken, one of only three filmmakers in history to have two Best Director Oscar nominations in the same year. Yep. And then, you know, he would do the Oceans movies. I like, and uh, he, he gets, he still got experience. Like, I liked Bubble that he did in yeah, 05, I was it? Yeah. Really, really like his remake of Solaris that he did with George oh, that was Yeah, you can like both those, by the way. I, I think. Oh, yeah. They're, they're very, very different. different. Yeah. Uh, and when people ask me, what are, what are some of the movies that aren't yet on Blu ray or 4K that you're dying to have? That's one of them. Yeah. The fact that that is not available in, in a beautiful print is a shame because it's a gorgeous movie. And you think he'd push for it. Like, he could get somebody to do that. I would think. Think so, yeah. You know, he's, he's such a fascinating guy because he would retire and then he came back. He's and the made best movies retired on. director of all time. That's oh yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, the movie he uh, he made on his iPhone for Netflix, High oh, Flying Bird, was yeah. a great and Love and Lucky. I like. Yeah, Unsane was great. I mean, he's just fascinating, fascinating guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, totally. This this starts a big run for him. Lopez, the next year, she becomes a pop star with their album, right? And takes a couple years off movies before doing the cell. But before this, she had an interesting year of U Turn, Anaconda, and Selena. It was like, here's my range, I, and then next I, year I hone it all in. I think she's terrific in Selena. I think mm-hmm. that's a really good musical biopic. Anaconda is a joy just to watch to see John Voigt get eaten. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I, I, I think it wasn't until just last year. Was that Hustlers was 2019 Hustlers, or 2018? Yeah, 20, I think it was 2019. It wasn't yeah. until Hustlers where I finally thought she was given a role to show everything she could do oh, yeah. that she had done in Out of Sight because she kept getting cast in either okay rom-coms mm-hmm. or terrible thrillers like that one she did. What was it? The Boy Next Door? Yeah, 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 yep. Just yeah. bad movies. And I was like, she is more talented than this. Yeah. And people go see her just with her name on the poster, though. She's right. one of the few that have that ability just to pull in money yeah. on her name like alone. i have a soft spot for made in manhattan i'm not gonna lie but that's not exactly a film that shows off yeah what sh- what she can do yeah i i think that the great thing about this movie going back to it and watching it was when you watch her you're like oh she was already here she did not arrive we arrived yep she just got the opportunity to be like check out i've been doing this and i couldn't agree more and we are late to the game. Nobody's arriving. You know, I would I would love to see Clooney and Lopez team up again for something. Because be like I said, they, they had such rare, chem, like, natural chemistry. You don't get that that often. Yeah. And, and chemistry is... can really make or break a movie, especially one that has, you oh, know, yeah. a will-they-won't-they they type of romance is such an integral part of the narrative. Mm-hmm. And this so, is uh, supposed to be Bullock and Clooney, but Bullock just, it wasn't... They, Soderbergh said she wasn't. She, they were great together, but she wasn't fitting the Elmore Leonard vibe that he wanted. Which I could see, and mm-hmm. I I like Sandra Willock a lot. I think she. I mean, I think in Gravity she's incredible. 
Mm-hmm. I think that's the one she should have won for, not the blind side. You know, and I, I think she's a, a terrific comedic actress, but I I, I can't visualize her no. having fit in the world that, that he built with this film. And in no, El- not Elmer in Leonard's this character. World. Not in this character. No. no. But maybe the Catherine Keenan char- yeah, yeah. character, maybe, but she wasn't going to take that small apart. Luckily, Sandy's an icon in her own right. So this oh, is yeah. a little she's had. <laughs> She'll be just. She's had a fine career. <laughs> she's had a fine career, but yeah, J- Jennifer Lopez here is just tremendous. And there's a lot of stuff with her that I see he uses, like angles and the way that some of the choreography that he uses again in Haywire many years down the road. I felt like I was seeing some of the genesis of that in areas, which was interesting. Yeah, Haywire is, is so fascinating. I'm not going to go on a Gina Carano rant, although I'm not a, not a, quite a fan. Uh, but not, but hey, not many of us are. <laughs> cer- certainly the physicality of mm-hmm. that character and what he did with Karen Sisko, you could definitely draw a through line there. That's really interesting. Some interesting little bits for me about this movie, what little ones that have stuck forever. George Clooney flicking the the zippo mm-hmm. when dvds were they, this movie came out at the advent of dvd kind of starting and starting to get a little more popular yep 97 98 is really when i started buying dvds right so universal had a sizzle reel on them to like oh dvd it would always start with him flicking the lighter and okay. the do 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 and the, and the the earth spinning for universal and it go through DVD is the new technology, and then it show a bunch of movies they had, but it always start with the lighter flick would be the first sound, mm. and then drums, and I always remember that, and it's from this movie. So if you ever put, put an old DVD and you see a lighter flick, it's George Clooney at the beginning of this movie. There you movie, go. That's, that's fascinating. I don't think I have any more DVDs at this point. Maybe a handful. Yeah. I, I also I, I did Blu-ray and DVD testing when I lived in Los Angeles, <laughs> and we did Universal titles, so that would be... If you got an old one that they were putting out again to test, that would be on there. But sure. uh, I always remember that. One of the best comedic lines from Dennis Farina of all time when Michael Keaton comes in the room with the FBI shirt on and he's like, you ever wear one of those that says undercover? Yeah, and, uh, I remember. That's so the good. Best lines. And Keaton's just, huh? What? But the fact that Michael Keaton came back, reprised his role and didn't charge yeah. and that Tarantino convinced Miramax to let them do it because they were go- they had the rights to the character. You know, I, I know cinematic universes now are sort mm-hmm. of like eye roll worthy because everyone tries to build them the wrong way. Right. But I would not be against like another Elmore Leonard adaptation with Michael Keaton as Ray Nicolette. Oh, or if you, if you brought JLo back as Karen Sisko, like obviously he kept writing these books where these characters would appear in, in different ways. Mm-hmm. I think there there would be a great opportunity to see some of these characters again. That could be really fun. Oh, I'd love to see that. That would be great. One of my other favorite things: White Boy's death. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I and I know it's, it's it's foreshadowed. Like he slips on the ice and falls to a knee before they go to the, do the job. He slips on the steps the first time they go up to him too, and then he slips when he's getting stuff out of the fridge. I'm like, oh, okay. They were <laughs> they were showing yep. us this. And then of course at the end. When Clooney gets into like the paddy wagon and get taken to jail, who oh, else yeah. is in there with him? But in another uncredited part, Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, that's huge. Not not playing his same character from Jackie Brown, mm-hmm. but still, I remember. I don't know if I don't know if when I first saw it, because like I said, I saw it in theaters when I was eleven. If I was super aware of who Samuel L. Jackson was, although. No, because Phantom Menace was the next year, so I'm, I don't even okay. know if I had seen him at that point. Oh, really? Then, okay. You, I'm not sure if I had seen him in anything because yeah. I hadn't seen Pulp Fiction at that time. Uh, well, yeah, you were. Al- <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't see Pulp Fiction until I was 14. Still, maybe too young. Yeah. But <laughs> like going back now, and you see Samuel L. Jackson, it's like who better to be in there with him to to make that ending scene have real impact? It's a great cameo. Like that's that's the power of like a cameo right there. And yeah. Know, him show it because like back then for me he was in like the negotiator and sphere like oh you know Park what and- i i i think i had you know i think i had seen the negotiator i remember seeing that in theater so if that was before then i had seen it yeah but yeah this was this was in his beginning of his climb and then two years later he'd be shaft and and also a year later he had the phantom menace so right it was, it was the exciting everybody knew who he was then you're in star yep. wars you're loved and hated for life it's great it's true and sometimes both at the same time <laughs> right 
right. Yeah, and this, as I mentioned, Entertainment Weekly ranked it the sexiest movie ever in 2008. So after out of 10 sight? years, yeah, out of sight. Yeah, sexiest like movie all time. I, I, you know, and I, you know, I think it's it's easy to be sexy when you're showing like graphic nudity and sex mm-hmm. scenes and, and stuff like that. I think it's so much harder to make something sexy when it's a little more into the imagination. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's what this movie really excels at is the furtive glances, the little hand touches, the editing, the smolder between the two of them, the way they look at each other. That mm-hmm. is so sexy. And it's you don't need Clooney to show... in the bathtub, not her. <laughs> yes, which, hey, very sexy. <laughs> he is a handsome man. <laughs> yes, very yes, much. he is. It's like, why did? how did it take... I mean, granted, he has a TV career from the 80s or the 90s, but man, the fact that it took so long for him to just leap off and be do his own just putting in the work like he used to yep. sleep in um tom matthews the star of return of the living dead and jason lives oh, they were best buds and grew up like being actors in hollywood and tom was supposed to be the one to take off and george paid him rent to sleep I, in his closet <laughs> i mean jason lives is my favorite friday the 13th movie yeah and that guy tom matthews he's a building contractor now and he's done George Clooney's house. They still keep in touch. And yeah. and now George Clooney has multiple Oscars. He sold right. a tequila company for a billion dollars. He has a new film coming out uh, in a couple weeks that right, yes. looks really, really good. He's doing all right. Uh, what is it? Midnight Sky? Is that what it's called? Yeah, it's yeah, a- yeah. I think, yeah, they just really released a new poster recently. I yeah, think, I think that looks good. But yeah, I, I think it's, and, you know, and like I said before, like to me, George Clooney's career as an actor and mm-hmm. everything he's accomplished can be traced back to this. I think this is where his yeah. like screen persona was really molded for the first time. Yeah. And he also has one of my first best first lines uh, when winning an Oscar. He said, well, it looks like they're not giving it me, to me for best director. Yep. I, <laughs> I, yeah. I, like, I mean, oh, it was how often? I mean, he won for Syriana and was yep. nominated for directing Good Night and Good Luck that yep. year. That's a very rare thing to happen to be nominated for a different film for mm-hmm. acting than directing. Yep, that mm-hmm. was great. I love Good Night and Good Luck. I think it's a great Oh, film. it's a great, yeah. People should check that one out easily. Yeah. And then, of course, Jennifer Lopez goes on to put on one of the best Super Bowl halftime shows. It's yeah, I was I was lucky enough to see J-Lo in Vegas. In oh, okay. Vegas show, and it's such a great show. She's yeah, I heard just, that was awesome. She's an incredible entertainer. She really is. And then, actually, my friend and I went and saw, she did like a 50th birthday tour. So here in New York at Madison Square Garden last summer, Okay. Before the world shut down in 2019. <laughs> and let me tell you, for a 50-year-old, oh, yeah. Whew, she's still she still got it. Yeah. Yeah, and she, yeah, she is just a present. Like this is a rare like these two are just big presences. Like just Yep. And they both are so generous to each other on the screen. There's no that's why the chemistry is so there. They're yeah, both- there's no ego, there's no one-upmanship. They're just <laughs> really it's a symbiotic performance from both of them yeah definitely yeah, and awesome. if you have not seen out of sight just buy it right yeah <laughs> like seriously it gets, own it. it it gets my highest possible recommendation oh yeah it's so good what else this is the segment where we talk about anything else we've worked on recently read watched you know other sorts of media that we'd like to plug here so maxwell what else I've been watching a lot of Christmas movies. You mentioned the show I host, Front Center Mezzanine, mm-hmm. but that show is on the PJ Campbell Network, which I'm a big part of. We do watch-alongs on Mondays and Fridays, okay. where me and PJ and the other rotating cast of people who are sort of in the network will watch a movie live, comment on it, engage with the chat. So I've been watching a lot of Christmas movies there, and that network does a lot of other shows. We do a show every Sunday night called The Unwind, where we just sort of relax and chill and talk about the week in, in movies. So a lot of my time since April, really, mm-hmm. has been focused on on the network. We, we produced a show called Box Box, which is a very silly uh, sort of scripted comedy show that we do. That's been fun. Then apart from my work with the network, I've been reading Rachel Bloom's book. You know, she created mm-hmm. and starred in My Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Yeah. She just published a book called I Want to Be Where the Normal People Are, which is like a a series of comedic essays based on her life and her experiences. And she's very vulnerable, very vulgar, very funny. Really enjoying that. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Myself, I've I open. I've only watched one. My Fellini box set from Criterion, 
Which oh, very nice. I see people buying stacks of like the the Barnes and Noble stale, and I was like, well, I yeah. had one. <laughs> that, that's a has, pretty good one. It's got fourteen movies in it, and, right? But I watched Variety Lights, which is a really awesome little tale. I don't think I'd seen that one before, but it's about a theater director, like a little company that travels, and he falls for a startlet, and she doesn't really use him, but he's kind of misled on his own doing, following her through her career, which she just constantly lets him down and just gives up on everything for her. As she succeeds, and he continues to falter at her side, but... It's a neat little movie. Dug it. Restoration's good. The box set's awesome. Do you have that one, Maxwell? No, I would love to get that one. I have yeah. a bunch of Criterions, but that one is... Gotcha. The art I, I is... Put, I, put, I put the Ingmar Bergman box set on my holiday wish list. Hopefully your so, shelf is strong enough. It's a heavy one. <laughs> yeah. One, it's a brick. <laughs> but it's it's all... That's a, that's a go. I still haven't finished going through that one. That's 39 movies. But yep. awesome. Like, I just... Putting out these director sets is just oh, I'm like who's next year? Like Truffaut? Are we gonna do Kurosawa? Kurosawa would be great. I mean, I own a lot of Kurosawas, but if they put out a set of all of his, I would buy it in a second. Trade it in for and last year filmmaker Godzilla got one. So I have I have the Godzilla one, which is great. And I watched last night, which will be two weeks ago when this drops, probably or a week and a half. I don't know. The Blade 4K Ultra HD. Oh, very nice. Whew, that looks great. I got that one for review, and I popped in last night. I was like, oh, dang, they really took care of Blade. (laughs) Because I think 4K is doing a lot of 90s films favors, because those would be hit and miss on Blu-ray when they came out, kind of like the the awe of them looking really clear. But I think because we got a lot of grungy, dark films back then, and now with the black levels of 4K Ultra HD and the HDR, they're able to handle them better, so now they're looking a little more impressive. So, but Blade was I, I, really good. The, the film that comes to mind that I would love to get a 4K release, inspired by what you just said, is The Crow. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. That would um, be one. Someone's gonna put that out. I think so because the Blu-ray doesn't look that great. And I, I got the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit 4K sets, but I, I am have not had the time to dive into those yet because I'm also in the middle of moving. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> so. And I that's have to review an those, and I yeah. don't have the time to put them in right now. I, mean, I can't wait to watch them. I mean, I've read, I've read some reviews and seen some screenshots, and yeah. they, they, the, the, the image quality looks spectacular. But, yeah, I, I, um, they, I are, they are, they are not short films. No, and they, they I want to watch the extended, and I, yeah, I, I hope my PR guy that like is patient with me. I told him I'm like, you know, because he didn't get them to me till like Saturday, and and they came out you know a day ago and i was like i hope you realize this is a undertaking but i yeah this this is not a one night review right. this is a, a week or two <laughs> i went over them on my youtube channel to show the packaging so sure. i just got that in but and i, I don't want to sit to rush through them to write about them i want to enjoy them so they're gonna have yep. to luckily no there's no bonus features on those at all they're straight movie but if you redeem the digital copy there are a couple featurettes on the digital but that's so you know I, the you know I lament how it seems like with the shifts in physical media that mm-hmm. bonus features are not as ex, you know not as as beloved as they once right. were. Yeah. I mean, like in the heyday of DVDs, I mean it was all about bonus features. Like yeah. I remember those extended editions of the Lord of the Rings films and those big sets each one came right. with, and they had hours and hours and hours of features. And now it's like on set five minutes. Like what? Yeah. No. Maybe a commentary if you're lucky. It's weird that the big studio movies that have the money for this, less bonus features, but the culty ones shot in New Jersey in the summer of like 70 something, loads, hour and a half documentary. It's great. But yeah, would, yeah, yeah. just love to see it. Who knows? Well, that'll wrap us up for today. Maxwell, I have had such an exciting time having you on here and recording together. Yeah, thank again. you for having me. It's great. Um, I can't remember the last time we recorded together was. It was probably like a year ago, and we're like, oh, yeah, just 2020 seems like forever. You know, you and I, we've had some of the best film discussions I've partaken in over the years, and we had another one today. And where could people keep up with you and find your work? You could follow me on Twitter at Cinemaxwell. I tweet a lot, a lot about movies and theater and sometimes politics. So if you don't like politics, maybe don't follow me. Instagram <laughs> at Cinemaxwell. Inc. Or they can learn. Or they can or, follow you well, and learn. Sometimes it's a lot of screaming at stuff. <laughs> Instagram is at Cinemaxwell Inc. And like I said before, I am a frequent contributor and producer on the PJ Campbell Network, which is uh, on YouTube. Uh, we have shows 
pretty much every night of, of the week that, you know, we talk about movies, we watch movies, we have show, a show called Suddenly Soundtracks, where we'll take a soundtrack from a movie and uh, go song by song and critique and analyze them outside of the context mm-hmm. of the film. We do family game nights on Saturday on our Twitch where we play like Mario Party or Among Us and all sorts of stuff. So we're always doing lots of fun stuff over at the PJ Campbell Network. All right. Well, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Brandon4KUHD. My written work on whysoblue.com. The show returns tomorrow with 4K Blues Day. Until then, always remember to keep the positivity in your online film discussion. Thank you for listening. The Brandon Peters Show is a Creative Zombie Studios production. Produced by Brad Shoemaker and Brandon Peters. Written and edited by Brandon Peters. Announcer vocals by Jessica Olsman. Theme song by Metavari. Web design and show art by Brad Shoemaker with Brandon Peters. All music and clips featured in the episode are property of their respective studios and no infringement is intended. Additional information on this and other episodes at thebrandonpetershow.com. For any inquiries, press opportunities, or sponsorship, contact mail at thebrandonpetershow.com. The show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere podcasts are found. Loretta, so you don't look like you're being held up. You got a very pretty smile.